Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> okay, moving on to the um, the agenda. We've no apologies for absence. We're all present tonight, which is good to see. And therefore, declarations of interest, agenda item two. Just briefly on this, um, my declarations of interest are in the process of being updated this evening. I've been uh, taken on as a director of Northwest Employers Executive Board. And um, so I'm just declaring that publicly now. It's not, there's no pecuniary interest, but I'm declaring that my interest will be updated this evening to reflect um, that appointment. Are there any other declarations of interest from any members? Thank you. Moving swiftly on, agenda item three, the minutes of the last meeting. Um, minutes of the last meeting held on the 14th of July 2021 are attached to be approved and signed as a correct record. Do any members of the cabinet have any questions on the accuracy of the minutes? Nope. Do I have a seconder to accept those? I'll second Let's make any comments from any members not on cabinet. Right, so all those in favour of accepting the minutes? Accepted, thank you. Okay, uh, agenda item four, the cabinet forward plan. Um, just find that here, bear with me a second. The cabinet forward plan, hopefully all members have seen, um, this was issued out uh, this afternoon by Democratic Services and the, it is what it is, there's lots on, um, as always for the coming um, months for cabinet and council. Uh, any questions for anyone on the cabinet forward plan? No, any members not on cabinet? Councillor Walton. Thank you, Chair. And good evening, everyone. Um, just a, a question really uh, about um, some of our members weren't able to view the forward plan and we had to contact Claire to send a separate email to, for us to access it. Um, that, that was one point. And then could you explain why, um, or bring us up to date, why 14 out of the 19 items on the plan, including agenda item 12 this evening, um, are uh, in part two? I assume it's because the confidential items, uh, Councillor Walton, Gary? All of them, all 14. No, 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 the world, not, no, all no, 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 no. not all of them will be. No, 14 out of the 19 are. The cabinet forward plan I'm looking at, Karen, does not um, state, indicate or state what you're stating there. Um, we'll look into it. The, the majority, the overwhelming majority of decisions are not, um, are not in part two. Anyway, we'll look into it. They, they only ever go into part two if there's an absolute necessity. You know that we try and take everything in the public forum. So we'll double check that. And we'll also double check on the link for yes. um, on where the cabinet forward plan is. As you know, it's a live document. Mm -hmm. It changes daily. Hence why we don't print it off yeah. a week before the um, when the agenda's sent out because it's out, it's always yeah, out of date by, the, by yes. the time of the meeting. Okay, thank okay. you. Okay. Yeah, it's just on the same vein, Chair. Really. Um, that, I mean, I've tried, had to make two or three inquiries to actually get hold of the, the corporate plan, uh, the uh, forward plan uh, for one that could actually open. Um, and we, we just sort of discussed it today and nobody could open it within our sort of a, um, <clears throat> shadow cabinet, if, if you like. Um, I did eventually get one later on this afternoon, which I'm assuming is the, the most up-to-date one. Uh, and in, in there, there are 14 items uh, out of the 19 that um, are uh, in, in part two, if you like. Uh, I, I do know that most of them, from the look of them, um, are um, maybe financial, but um, it just maybe it's just a bit unusual. But that, uh, that's a, that's where it is. Uh, you, you've obviously got different ones. So yeah, well, well but Councillor Smith will look at it. If you know, it only goes into part two if it's relevant. And as I said to, to Councillor Mrs. Walton. Right. Okay. So we've got the 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 forward plan and the a notice of any executive decisions and as you all know 
the all the executive decisions and any urgent decisions are also published on the in full on the council agenda and we'll look at that next week right so that's noted moving swiftly on the shared consultation framework so the the report that we have in front of us basically um colleagues is looking at putting a formal policy in place for how the council should look to consult as we know the it's a priority of the administration to consult whenever and as much as we possibly can with our local community stakeholders and partners what we have never had in the past is actually a formal framework or policy to work to and therefore we the officers have adopted this uh, the new consultation framework 2021 in conjunction with our colleagues at Chorley Council let's be clear this is not absolutely how every single consultation will be carried out what it is, it is providing us a toolkit for officers to work towards there are certain milestones that they must um, achieve with the consultation and at the end of the day all we're trying to do here is consult better with more people and have an improvement on what clearly on some occasions hasn't been the greatest of consultations and this is a, some feedback that we've had from um, many members of our community what we are noting though is more recently that the quality and quantity of responses that we're getting back from um, stakeholders and members of the public to what we're doing is is very positive and most certainly people are becoming more engaged and i do think that in the main is down to the correct use of social media as well the community do want to get engaged and it's our duty to speak to them so the frameworks um in front of us and we're asked to approve it so does any member of cabinet have any comments to make on yellow <clears throat> thank you chair um no, I just want to echo really what you've said and that I'm really pleased to see this consultation framework. Um, it's really useful, obviously, to encourage consistency, thoroughness and full engagement with communities, um, particularly because I'm over the community hubs. Um, and we have just started a programme of community conversations and we've also just completed a consultation in Moss Side um, perhaps would have been good to have seen this um, before we carried that consultation out, not saying that anything was wrong with that, but this would have been really nice to have this framework um, moving forwards. Obviously, anything else that we might do in the community hubs, we want to mm. use this. Um, two, just two final points. Um, this ties in really nicely with the Cooperative Council Innovation Network. Um, because that's the, the objective of that is that we engage and consult as much as possible and, desi and design um, projects and things like that around what the community wants. And finally, I would just like to see a consultation checklist. Um, and that is something which came out of the community involvement review that we did. Um, and it's, I suppose it's a shortened version of this for officers just to be able to tick off to make sure that they've done as all the you know these statutory things um, and then potentially some additional things to make sure that we've got it covered up but if that's that's everything thanks cheers on yeah i think the community conversations have there's a huge opportunity there isn't there and i know that the first round were a little bit challenging for a number of reasons mostly because we're still in the midst of a pandemic and you know but we would certainly need to adapt and really push them forward and in respect to your checklist, there, there is a consultation initiation document. It's a very officer type wordy um, that perhaps just needs enhancing slightly. And I'm, I'm, you know, I'm sure the officers will do that, Gary, as we adopt this and um, perhaps something that can come forward for us to review later. And you can get the community hubs back to, to, to feed into that as well. Any other questions? Nick? Uh, well, I think it's a, it's a document that will be welcomed throughout. It brings uh, as uh, as Annie Heller has said, it brings some consistency uh, to, the, to the process. I mean, officers uh, and members will know uh, the procedures to be adopted uh, in certain cases. So um, uh, I think it's, uh, it's long overdue. It, as it says in the recommendations, it brings that consistency. It's, uh, it's got that guidance uh, and it maximises the opportunity to uh, involve uh, those that we are consulting with so happy all around to to endorse that. I'll speak Matthew. 
Yeah, thanks, Lee. I think it's another step forward, really, on the way we've tried to change things over the last two years. And what this does will bring, what it will do, is bring a robustness to the decision making uh, process and help support the decisions that are taken. How often are we heard um, members who don't like a decision that's being taken for whatever reason and they fall back on, well, the consultation was rubbish anyway. Um, and what this will do, it will show that we, you know, if there is a process that we've all signed up to and all agreed, have we followed that process? Yes, we have. Uh, you might not like the decision, but what you can't argue with is that the consultation hasn't been carried out within that framework. And I think, you know, for good decision making, um, that's a really useful tool and, and I hope everybody will welcome it. Thanks, Matthew. I wholeheartedly agree. Um, good. So we've, um, I proposed, Aniela, you've seconded the, we adopt this policy. Any questions from any members not on committee? Councillor Ogilvy and then Councillor Smith. Thank you, Chair. Just a quick one on the um, GDPR implications. The Council has had its challenges over the, over the years on GDPR. Um, is there going to be a requirement for any additional training or new type of training or basically is the training already undertaken sufficient to meet the needs of this new framework? The, 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 just before I call the Chief Exec in, so the, the, the challenges, Alan, that you're referring to, the GDPR challenges um, that we um, inherited have been dealt with now. I think more of the concern for me in respect to GDPR is the fact the government are thinking about binning it which would provide a few challenges, but hey ho. Um, Gary? Yeah, uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, yeah, just to reassure Alan that the, the, the officers are trained in GDP, GDPR, it won't be an issue. Thanks, Gary, thanks. Alan, uh, Councillor Smith? Sorry, I've, I've not got my glasses, so I'm, I'm struggling a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you, Chair. At least if the consultation is rubbish in future, perhaps this document will tell us it's rubbish, will it? Something to monitor it by. Uh, just on, on, on that, I mean, I, it's one of my pet hates, and I don't know whether it's a, a statutory uh, duty, but Appendix C, with the 10 questions on Appendix C, and if you go into Appendix D, it's the same for Chorley. Um, I have to say it's one of my pet hates is sort of these type of inquiries into people's um, own business, to be quite honest, and I just don't like it. Uh, I think it starts a consultation off in a very bad way. Um, members might have a different opinion of that, but I just don't I just don't like those sort of questions, really, to be quite honest. We're all equal. We're all the same. Consultation should be designed so and it shouldn't identify these sort of areas. That's just a comment, Chair. Yeah, thank you. I'm sure our lead member sat behind you for equality and diversity would disagree with you, Phil, wholeheartedly. Um, we have a legal requirement as well, and it's why well, we, we will do it because it's the right thing to do. Um, you can add to that. No. Any other questions for anyone? Right, good. So we've had a proposer and a seconder that the shared consultation framework. Um, oh, sorry, couldn't see you there, Mr. Derbyshire. Members of the public. Uh, thank you, Chair. I think my question is very similar to Councillor Smith's. Um, I think we all agree that the citizen of this borough is treated equally, no matter what gender, age, able, disability, skin colour, sexuality or their partnership. In this case, why do, we, why do, you, do you as a council issue this disgraceful document delving into the personal private dispositions? My question is, do you agree with me, the only place for this document should be placed in the rubbish bin? No, and it's optional, and it's ensuring a representative sample of our um, community is consulted upon. And when the samples aren't representative, 
then to ensure equality across the borough, we can then target certain areas and perhaps do some more work, Mr Darvish. So no, I don't agree with you. Thank you. Thank um, you. Right, so by the proposal myself, Councillor Belinsky Gelder is seconding that we um, the shared consultation framework is adopted. Is everyone in favour? Unanimous, thank you. Um, agenda item six, the quarter one performance monitoring report 2021-22. And um, the purpose of the report is to provide Cabinet with a position statement for the corporate strategy for the first quarter of the municipal year, April to June um, of this year. Um, this has already been to the scrutiny budget and performance panel uh, the other day. And if I may, I'm going to read out the recommendations that came from the scrutiny. I think it was, it was a good 45 minutes, the scrutiny committee uh, questions on this. And it was um, challenging as it should be. Um, the, the panel, just so we, because again, we've been asked to adopt and accept the recommendations from the um, the panel as well. So the panel thanked the Legion Chief Executive for attending and for the, the detail of the report, welcomed the performance report and progress made in the first quarter of the year. The scrutiny committee is grateful for the commitment for the new single strategic partnership to be scrutinised in the future and potential for joint scrutiny with Chorley. They, number four, they asked for the key performance indicator for fuel poverty to be reviewed as part of the next refresh of the corporate strategy. Number five, they looked forward to receiving further information on the number of young people engaged in the community conversations and the link being made with mental health. And number six, they welcomed the offer of further examples of the outcome from the community hubs in future reports and the proposed evaluation. Number seven, I looked forward to future reports, including information on credit union take up rates. And finally, they were grateful for the offer on an update on the pre planning advice services resuming and the customer service response times. Um, I have no problems whatsoever in accepting all those um, recommendations and requests for additional information. I'm going to assure that the budget and performance panel is furnished with those at the earliest opportunity. Many of them were already part and parcel of the reporting process anyway, um, where they sit within individual portfolios, I'm aware that they are being dealt with. Um, the, obviously, it's a detailed um, performance report. Um, the council's in a great position, considering, as, I, as I've said before, that we're in the midst of a global pandemic. Um, there are no major issues of concern that um, I report to Cabinet, there are one or two of the uh, major corporate projects that are, that are amber on the register and the detail is there as to why I'll quickly go through it. Um, the ICE under, under the Exemplary Council, the ICT delivering year one of the joint digital strategy is slightly delayed. I think all members are acutely aware that we've had some significant challenges with the IT provision, particularly the hardware and the upgrade, the significant upgrades that ASIM and the team have gone through. We're now through the worst and I'm confident that we'll be back on to green for the next quarter report. Thriving communities is all green and on target. A fair local economy that works for everybody. The, there's the one amber there, which is the establishing a business support programme. Again, hopefully all council are aware that we've had some challenges with the late, very late notice from government regarding some of the COVID business payments and the criteria that we are now, uh, we now need to undertake in issuing of those. But the, the business working group is working tirelessly to deliver that. And we're confident again, now we have the information from government on the latest round that those will be issued um, in full as quickly as possible. Our concern is if there's any additional grant funding now that comes through through the winter, that if the criteria changes again, it's proven a huge challenge for the council and the businesses. So what we're wanting to see and we're feeding back to government is some consistency now on these business grants. Um, good homes, green spaces, healthy spaces, commencing the building of affordable homes within the borough is amber. Again, uh, there's a report going to council next week on the challenges that we're facing with um, the, the construction costs 
um, post Brexit and post COVID, and we're dealing with that. But again, once council makes that positive decision next week, then that should be back on track. And please don't forget that we've also already approved the commencement of the detailed um, planning application for the extra care scheme on West Paddock, and we have delivered Tom Hansen House in um, Bamber Bridge as well. So that's reporting by exception. I don't know if any of my colleagues on cabinet have any particular questions or points they wish to raise on the performance report. No. Nope. Um, any members not on cabinet? Councillor Brotherton. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, it was just a comment on uh, page 43 uh, under uh, the co commenced building of affordable homes. Uh, there's a comment there that that, um, that says the stage one tender process has been undertaken for the Mackenzie arm site where project costs will be fully assessed and may require the project to be redesigned or scaled accordingly. Would you agree with me that it's probably now a good time to go back to the drawing board and uh, given that the comment here is potentially to redesign um, and perhaps look at the initial report of October 2019 under the value for money section uh, when an alternative uh, scheme was was recommended um, which would have resulted <coughs> in, in no capital loss whereas uh, the initial scheme here before any potential increased costs was a loss of seven hundred thousand pounds uh, that could escalate um, as we'll probably find out at, at full council uh, would you agree with me? It's probably a good time to redesign the project and go back to the drawing board. Um, I wholeheartedly disagree with you, Councillor Brotherton, and your terminology again is very political. In investing money into affordable homes from 106 contributions and, and um, other financial sources is not a loss. It's called a capital cost. It's not a loss. And if you look at the report carefully, you'll see that the council makes an annual profit, a return on that investment. And it's the understanding of social value in value for money. Value for money is not about just how much something costs. And we've said this time and time again, that the you keep saying that we're making a loss. We are not making a loss. We're investing in our community. It may be a political issue. You don't want to invest in your community. We do, and we want high quality, affordable homes. Again, this debate can be taken to next week because you've clearly seen the paper that we've sent to Council and um, I, I, I look forward to the debate, Councillor Brotherton, but no, I wholeheartedly disagree. Any other questions from anyone? Any questions from members of the public? Mr Derbyshire? Um, thank you, Chair. My question is on Appendix 1, page 47, Good Homes, Green Spaces and Healthy Places. It states that 27,000 trees to be planted this year. That's fantastic. I love trees that are planted, but more importantly, I love trees that survive to maturity, not like the Horrocks Way plantation, where up to 75% of the 27,000 trees have not survived. Not only this, is this a disaster for the climate change plan, but a criminal way of ratepayers and taxpayers hard in cash. Therefore, I suggest that an additional indicator is issued so when the percentage of trees that have survived, say, after 12 months. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mr Derbyshire. I'm aware that you know the figures you've just quoted there are incorrect because I've seen the formal response back from um, Council Martin, yeah. to you, the, the, your figures are incorrect. Uh, hang on. Secondly, Sorry. and secondly, perhaps you want to go to your friends at Lancashire County Council because they're the people that actually planted those trees as part of the bypass, um, not South Ribble Borough Council. And thirdly, as you're aware, not every tree that is planted survives. We are now giving every um, effort to plant even more than 110,000 trees within South Ribble. 
but I will not stand criticised, nor will this council, for doing its best to plant as many trees as it possibly can. I don't disagree with how many trees you plant, Paul, as I said originally. Uh, the figures quoted by Keith uh, Martin to me via a South Ribble uh, expert of us all, um, I totally disagree with those figures. My house backs onto that plantation. I walk round there. It is a total and utter disaster. It is riddled with noxious weeds, thistles, which should be destroyed by the owner of the land, which I'm, I don't know if it's this council or LCC's land. But my figures are better than those figures there. So I suggest that the uh, the councillor who is responsible for that patch, I think it's Angie, I think, goes there and has a proper look at those trees. I have, and it's an absolute damn disgrace what's happening there. Those figures given by Keith are totally and utterly wrong. Now, you accept my figures, you accept his figures. No. I'm, I'm not entering, Mr. Darwish, I'm not entering into the debate about it. The facts are the facts. And the other issue that you'll, just, I'm not arguing with you, Mr. Derbyshire. The facts are the facts. Our tree team have been down, they have inspected, they expect a certain number of whips not to survive. The other thing that we're doing that you'll have noticed, Bernard, you might be confusing wildflower meadows and weeds, is that we are, wherever possible, not cutting the grass because it encourages where best for biodiversity, which we speak to Councillor Bretherton about, he is fully supportive of. So we will continue to report accurately on, and um, continue to plant, sorry, as many trees as we possibly can in the borough. And that's that. Where were we? Questions from the member of the public. It's not been 18 months, is it? So, um, sorry. Yes, yeah, sorry. So, um, right, Cabinet's asked to consider and comment on the report. We have, and it's noted. Thank you. So, Agenda item seven, colleagues, is the workplace strategy. Um, and we've been asked here to, uh, that the workplace strategy is approved and progressed to support the future efficient operation of the organisation. I'm going to ask Gary to, to, to speak on this now because it is the detail of ultimately of how the council is going to operate moving forward. But what I would say on behalf of the cabinet, Gary, and given the fact that I attended the Northwest Employers um, Executive Board yesterday, that um, we are right at the front of the game with this, and it's really pleasing to see that the the detailed report has been submitted um, in September. You know, we're still within the pandemic, and it's really good to see the feedback that we've had from the unions that everybody's fully engaged. So for that, thank you. And now could you give us a, a top level briefing, if you could, on, on what's been proposed? Uh, thank, thank you, Chair, of course. Um, so um, I suppose um, tonight is the start of getting back to something called normal uh, and what that looks like, which I, I'm sure we all um, we all welcome. Um, members will be aware that uh, during the pandemic, uh, essentially um, the bulk of uh, staff time has been spent working from home. Um, uh, that obviously can't be done for some elements of the workforce, but for the, for the bulk of office-based staff, um, they've been working from home. What we now need to do is establish uh, what um, work life looks like as we move forward, uh, as we hopefully uh, move out of the pandemic, but that does depend which paper you read and what might, what might come next. That said, um, what we are now able to do is to flip uh, to different ways of working so that if um, uh, during the, the next few months uh, the pandemic returns or things get worse, we can flip back. However, uh, it's important uh, for both the organisation and for staff to understand how we're going to work in, in the future and what, what we're committing to. Clearly, um, uh, during the period that people have been working from home, um, what we've been trying to do is to establish, well, how effective has that been, both for the organisation and for staff as well? What have been the benefits of that? Uh, and there have been some benefits. Uh, if you talk to more staff, they'll say that uh, working more flexibly uh, offers them some benefits. There have been some challenges with it as well, and we need to uh, remember that, both in terms of uh, how we deliver our services uh, more importantly, from my perspective, how we manage staff in a completely different way to what we've been used to previously. And that's brought with it some challenges. 
However, that said, uh, what we're setting out here, hopefully, is a, a kind of a, a pathway to what the future might look like. And as you can imagine, um, what, we're, what we're presenting here is, is the hybrid solution. So not working from home all the time and not working from the office all the time. It combines a number of strategies um, where uh, we've been looking to make uh, better use of technology and make ourselves more efficient in how we do things. Uh, it starts to talk about uh, what the workspace might look like as we move forward and what the expectations of staff and the organisation are as we move forward. So it's a set of principles, you know, it's not uh, set out in stone exactly how you must work and some organisations have tackled it in that way. If you look at the private sector, you'll see either some saying you must get back to work completely or a number saying that they'll split the work uh, work uh, period where sometimes you have to be in the office for two days say or sometimes for three. Um, we're going to we're going to be a little bit more flexible than that at this time, but set a number of parameters uh, under which staff have to work. This for me is, is part of a contract uh, with staff. It says, well, we accept that actually uh, there are some benefits to you uh, from working more flexibly and working in a hybrid way, but it has to be effective for the organisation. And I have heard um, a, a number of members say, for instance, uh, I found it quite difficult to get hold of that person. So that's not acceptable um, when we work in a hybrid way. We have to fix some of the issues that emerged uh, during the pandemic and in, in, in terms of um, how we worked during that period. So it will require commitment from staff to work in a completely different way. It will um, uh, need them to commit to ensuring that the level of service uh, that we, uh, we give to both residents and to members is kept to level that's acceptable or better than acceptable to us all. But it will require uh, the, the management of the organisation and members, everybody in this room, to accept that actually we are going to work in a different way. That enables us to do a number of things. I think, you know, we were on a journey in terms of the technology and there have been some real challenges with that. And there are still some challenges with the technology, but we've moved forward in a number of ways. There are some back office bits of kit um, that need updating. There's some software that, need, that needs updating, updating to enable us to work in a better way. Uh, and we're on with all, all those things. It requires us to kind of retrofit what the offices look like because we won't need as many uh, desk spaces if we work in that particular way. That should uh, free up space for us to consider alternative uses uh, of that space uh, into the future. So again, uh, this sets out the core principles of how we're going to work and what we need to do now is to work that through and put the flesh on the bones and some of the key elements of that around staffing, management uh, and utilisation of our asset space. And we'll do those things as we kind of move forward if this policy is adopted. I'll, I'll leave it at that chair unless uh, people want any more detail. Well, that's... Uh, Thanks, Gary. Um, I, as I say, I'm just really pleased that you, the, the the senior management team has got on and looked at this straight away. And I'm also really pleased, by the way, I meant to say this at the beginning, that it's, uh, members will have noticed it's another um, shared service policy amongst the, the, the two authorities. Again, surely that, you know, should be applauded by everyone. It's, you know, we're not double bubbling the work here. It's, you know, it's good to see efficient use of officers' time, sharing policies wherever possible. Um, regarding officer contacts, it has been challenging, but the you know we've all got teams now that the, and I think we're all noticing members really quickly that the officers are, are, it's much 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 easier to contact um, officers now through Teams. It's a bit odd speaking to your iPad, but it's I'm sure we'll get used to it. Um, we would ask Gary that you, as you've you've done over the last um, 18 months, two years, you do keep the unions engaged with everything that we look to do relationship we have here at South River and I, and I do believe with Chorley as well, a very strong good working relationship with the unions and clearly they represent the staff and I think it's you know retails what you just said there at the end it's what we need is flexibility, flexibility from members, flexibility from staff and this is a, a, a I see a huge opportunity. Yeah I've got to get the balance right uh, and uh, you know I'm not going to set that out in stone because um, you set yourself up to fail if you do that. 
Um, but we've got to accept that um, there are some significant benefits to the organisation of um, being in the office. Yeah. Um, so uh, for me, uh, things like uh, developing relationships. Uh, there are some people who started in the organisation who I've never met. And that feels really bizarre. Um, so, you know, that, that human, that personal contact, I think is really important. Uh, it's also important in terms of thinking about new people, particularly younger people coming to our organisation. How do they learn things? You can't learn things over the internet. Well, you can. <laughs> It'd be a strange world, I think. Um, you know, how do you, how do you get learned behaviours? Um, you don't get that over the internet. So it's really complex and it's going to be really difficult moving forward. But I'm hoping that we can get the right balance uh, in terms of adopting this, this strategy. Thanks, Gary. Cultural changes are the hardest type they of changes, are. aren't they? Any questions, Councillor Tomlinson? Thanks, it's not a question really. I want to um, welcome the fact that we've moved on this. I was asking maybe a year ago, what will the new normal look like? Um, and the fact that flexibility is going to be uh, the future, really, of working arrangements for many, many people. I think necessity is the mother of invention, and what the pandemic's done, it's changed so many things quickly that we're probably going to change over a 10-year period anyway. Things like, you know, the move to online shopping and all that kind of thing, they were going to happen, um, and it's just happened more quickly. And I think it's the same for working practices, um, I think, quite, and I think that most staff, most staff, and certainly the people I've talked to, not just here but in other organisations, are looking forward to being a flexible worker and having the opportunity to say, yes, I will, I do want to go in the office, I do want to meet with my colleagues and, and my managers, um, but I can work from home one or two days a week, and I welcome not having to sit in my car for 45 minutes each way. Um, to do what I could be doing um, in the spare bedroom at home. I think the strategy will be useful for us as members, but for the staff as well, to see we are thinking about this. You know, it's something the organisation is planning for um, and we'll be able to hopefully work with them to develop a new a new way of working and a more modern workforce. I think it's, it's really encouraging to see it. I'm really pleased it's here. Yeah, thanks, Matthew. I've seen some um, interesting, that's some interesting articles actually over the the, the past weeks. How um, productivity has demonstrably improved with this flexible approach. So again, UK PLC needs to see better productivity, doesn't it? So hopefully that could be an outcome as well. Yeah, I mean we've got we've got some evidence of that already, um, but equally we've got evidence of where there's less productivity. So. Um, it's, it's sometimes it's horses for courses, sometimes it's easier to measure. So where it's very transactional, it's really easy for us to measure that level of productivity where, where it's not transactional, it's more difficult. So this is what I was saying about how do we flex and, and develop our management arrangements so that we're able to demonstrate that because we've got to be able to demonstrate value for money uh, right throughout. So and those are things that we'll be kind of working on in, into the future. Um, the, the key to this is technology. Um, and this isn't Big Brother, this is an, enabling us to uh, be able to demonstrate that we can evidence what we're saying, you know, we can evidence that productivity is good and is, is, is improving. So um, we don't have all those systems in place at the minute. Um, we do for some and we work in a different way in, in some of the services. It's about being consistent because this is the thing that staff will say to me, he says, well, it has to be consistent, doesn't it? We, have, we all have to be treated the same and fairly. Uh, that's easier, say, easier said than done because we're all doing different things, um, but that's what we obviously aspire to. Nick? Yeah, well, I, well, I welcome the, uh, the, this, this paper and I think it's, a, it's an excellent paper. Um, I think that we all realise is that, I mean, what, you know, whatever the pandemic has done, it's made us look at, uh, at life differently, uh, not just socially, family life and everything else like that, but uh, work, work ways. I mean, and I think that we, prior to the pandemic, we were uh, working towards exploiting technology so that we could get that uh, degree of efficiency. And I think, you know, even previous administrations, we have spoken about how we can uh, exploit 
uh, technology so that we do that we do the uh, get that efficiency um, and I think those things that you, you you mentioned Gary about you know the in, the individuals I mean there are benefits from working from home and you know often uh, you can sort of an, an employee might feel that they can get more more work done at home in in that environment but equally you miss that uh, camaraderie and the sort of the, the social intercourse and uh, you know being able to sort of uh, discuss things that are going on um, and you sort of identify a, as a team don't you but I mean I think uh, the papers is summed up with uh, in paragraph 19 with the outcomes and benefits uh, when it says the strategy will deliver extensive benefits including greater efficiency improved customer experience increased staff morale and better use of uh, assets with potential for income generation uh, as well as envir environmental benefits. Now, I mean, you know, that might sound like a utopia, but I mean, that is something that we've got to strive for. I mean, and I do accept there'll be bumps al along the way. Um, you know, people, um, it's difficult to, you know, you know, to sort of, to manage change, in, you know, to, to this extent. Um, but I mean, it is something that uh, that has to be done, and you have to take the staff, uh, the, the staff with us. But the common cause has to be those services that we provide, and if the uh, if the people that we represent can see uh, positive outcomes um, uh, and you know early responses to any queries that they have, uh, then uh, so, so then it will. I think we'll all applaud that. But uh, just looking at the paper, yeah, I mean, I think it's a, it's an excellent paper. It bill it, it it sets out a way a way forward, uh, and yeah, as I say, there will be uh, issues that arise along the way. But uh, you know, that's life, isn't it? You have to you have to deal with them as they arrive. Uh, but I really welcome the paper. I think it's an excellent paper. Thanks, Mick. Um, any other points from any members? Any members not on Councillor Ogilvie and Councillor yeah, Martin? Thank, thanks, Chair. Um, yes, the the world is changing, and it's right that the council doesn't get left behind. Um, Gary has mentioned the two words that, that I think are, are key for for me. One is flexibility, which I think is actually the easier of the two words. The second word is consistency, and I'm just wondering. <sighs> Is it going to be up to a department head as to how he allocates flexibility to his smaller team? Is it up to the director of, of an area to determine how that should be done? Is it going to be a council policy that everybody will have the same level of flexibility? And that is going to be the real challenge, I think, in terms of how, how we can get this to work properly. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, um, spot on. Uh, oh, that's going to be the challenge. I've already had some of those challenges. Um, the, the, what, what, what I've said to um, uh, directors uh, and to the senior team is that um, any decisions that they make have to be backed up by the ability to demonstrate that actually that way of working is effective. Because that's the key here, isn't it? Can you demonstrate to me that actually you're providing a good service, you can demonstrate it, your team are productive, you can demonstrate it, and that the cultural elements that we talk about are equally uh, at your, the forefront of your mind. How are you building your team? How are you developing individuals? And it will be different. It has to be different for different areas because they work in a different way. And um, I think I mentioned a little bit earlier, at the minute, it's easier for some teams to work from home because the technology solutions are better than some, some of the other areas. So it's all different. Um, it depends on service demand as well. So let's take customer services, for instance. You know, there is a demand for face-to-face -face work. So we're going to have to flex how we work with that particular workforce, how many times they come in, who comes in, what's demand like. It's a, it's a, I think I tried to explain, it's a really complex piece to try and get absolutely right. So, um, all I can um, give back to you, Alan, is that I'll set a set of parameters and 
we will work to those parameters and if it doesn't work then we'll change things so it's about monitoring and managing right throughout the change process say well actually you did this you haven't achieved this how can we change it um, and the challenge there is of course is people get used to working in a particular way so you might agree something and this is where the cultural things and the real difficulties arise because you've agreed something but actually we can't demonstrate it's it's effective and that's where the challenge comes in for me <laughs> to be able to explain to people well actually you started with this but it has to change again so but that's my issue to deal with okay thanks gary um yeah, sorry um councillor keith martin uh thank you leader um it, it's a good report. I'm, I'm pleased with it as, as someone who, who works with employees in another in another world from here. Um, I'm quite pleased that, that that's there. I think from my own experience from, from working with, with, with colleagues at my employment is is sometimes presenteeism can be an issue where, where people will continue to work even though they shouldn't be at work technically if they were ill. Um, it, it can encourage a little bit of that and obviously members have to appreciate that not everyone can do their work from home. I wish I could, a remote control digger would be great, but unfortunately that, that will never happen um, because of the legislation that's in place. So I, I do applaud and um, it's going to be a job of work and I, I wish you all very well in doing it and, and I hope that it, you vary it and look at it in a pragmatic way so that everyone can benefit from it. That's, I think that's my only comment. Thank you, Chair. Thanks for your kind comments, Keith. Uh, Councillor Jackie Alty and then Councillor Betherton. Uh, yeah, just um, I enjoyed, I'm sorry, I'm getting feedback. Uh, I enjoyed reading the proposal. Uh, one thing, um, Gary, you mentioned um, consistency and as did uh, Councillor Ogilvy. Um, one of the things that springs to my mind is um, consistency and justification across all services of uh, expectations isn't always possible and um, I'm not so sure that it's always necessary. So I would say given that all individuals have potential to reach, um, the more flexibility we're building to any system is, is better and that we need to value the different applications, not necessarily iron out all the creases and use the personal stories. We talked about valuing, um, how value isn't necessarily monetary. Um, it can be quantified in lots of different ways. And I think the personal stories of the people that we employ and the journeys that they take are equally as valid as productivity levels from a measurable point of view. So I'll just raise that, thank you. Thanks, Jackie. And yeah, because I think that's a fair point because we've, we've said, haven't we, let's be flexible. And then we're saying, but we're going to be consistent. And the, the two are, are opposing. Let me. So, so let's just be clear on this. The overriding issue here is the needs of the service. That's the driver here. Uh, and what, what, we will, what we will attempt to do is get consistency in those areas where consistency can be achieved because you will never get absolute consistency. Okay, um, so um, I'm, trying, I'm trying to think of a really good example um, of um, where that will apply. Um, so so uh, people who are predominantly uh, office based, I imagine that actually we could get consistency between everybody who's office based. People who work in and out of the office, dependent on what service you're in, I imagine we, we will look for consistency for those cohort of people who work in that way. That's where we'll get the consistency, not always of course for everybody. Unless of course what we do determine over a period, and I'm not advocating this, is we work on a model of say three and two or two and three, where you're in the office more those times and all. I'm not advocating that at the minute, we're going to try with the flexible model uh, at the minute, but that's where we'll get look to get the consistency. Thanks Gary. So you're going to be consistently flexible, is what you say. You, Councillor Betherton. Yeah, thank you, Chair. This uh, it's it's a report that reflects the uh, the, the whole economy, uh, as some members have already uh, commented. In, in that, uh, since the pandemic, businesses have looked at all the empty office space and realised that actually it's more productive 
people working from home, etc., etc., etc. With that in mind, um, uh, and we go down uh, this this route mm. of flexible working, etc., that means there will be <clears throat> less need for office space in this building, for example. So we could find ourselves with more office space available, but bear in mind that uh, most businesses aren't going down the route of expanding office space. Have we given some consideration of uh, possible alternative uses for uh, an income generation, uh, as it's mentioned in here, other than office? It's part. It's part of the review, isn't it? It's the. It's part of the critical asset review. There's the voluntary sector that we aim to, but we've got plenty of space here in um, in West Paddock. But the, we're not at that point yet, Damien. You know, we need Gary and the team to do the work. But you know the, the space is flexible, and as you know, we've already introduced many other public sector organisations into the um, into the civic centre, and it may be that the, the, there's more. But I think it's part. Of, it says in the paper, doesn't it? As part of the, the the overall review, there's got to be an asset review, hasn't there? So we've got Gary, then Mick, and then Matthew. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, it's a very good point. Um, the, Paul talked about uh, other public sector partners that we have in. It, it will be about do we repurpose. Uh, the building uh, for other things. So, um, despite all the changes um, in in the way we work, there is still demand for office space. It's a different type of office space. It's more flexible demand for office space. So, these are all things we'll have to look at. But what I've got to do is is let the model emerge, see what the demand the asset uh, demand is, and then you know we can look at, at, uh, at the asset review and what we what we might do with the spare space because there will undoubtedly be uh, spare space. I I just think that we've got to remember is that within the documents or within the discussion uh, or in the you know this evening you can't legislate for every eventuality. What you what you what you do is what you've got here. You lay out the strategy and you try and deliver that strategy. But along the way, there are sorts of uh, consequences, things develop, um, you know, issues arise and that you've got, you, you, you've got to adapt. But on that specific point about uh, space and availability, we are constantly getting requests from community groups and others to use the space here. So, I mean, of all the possible things that might, uh, might come about, um, the, uh, the the lack of use of space, I think, is the least to worry about because there's plenty of uh, groups, you know, businesses, charities, uh, community groups who are who are really putting in requests to us for you know for, for space. Uh, but I mean, I understand that you know people's concerns and all that, but sometimes I mean. You've got to face those issues as they arise, haven't you? You can't sort of legislate for it, you know, well, well in advance. Thanks, Matthew. Yeah, thanks. I mean, there is a passing mention of that in the report. Um, and the reason it is passing mention, because at this stage, we're just not ready to talk about what it might look like. When you think, when I first got elected to this council, we occupied all four floors of this building. Every single floor of this uh, building was filled with council workers. And over the years, whoever's been in charge, when Howard Gore was in charge and we got New Reg, and then as we shrunk a bit more, DWP, CAB coming, you know, we have a, a, a long track record of using the space as best as, as we can. And undoubtedly, if we, if we go to a 3-2 model, that means suddenly only 60% of the office space that we're currently being used is being used. And of course, you know, when that arise and there's an occasion for us to hopefully generate some income, I'm sure that this council will do it. Thanks, Matthew, absolutely. Um, Councillor Walton, you want to say yes, something? Thank, thank, thank you, you. Um, Chair. Yes, I, I welcome the principles of the workplace strategy and uh, hopefully it will provide the flexibility and the consistency for the organisation to move forward. And I thank Gary for coming to tonight and explaining it in, in quite quite detailed to us what 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 it's, it's all about and I look forward to the future and the updates on the progress. Thank you. Thanks Karen. Um, Councillor Phil Smith. 
just going over old ground, uh, Chair, but um, yeah, Gary, thank you for that presentation. It uh, gives a bit of uh, hope, I think, going forward for the, for the staff and uh, a, a flexibly consistent workforce or a consistently flexible workforce, depends on which way you put the words, doesn't it? But uh, I'm sure it'll all come uh, work well in the end. Thanks, Phil. Um, any other members? No. Any members of the public? No. Right. Um, right. So with the cabinet's been asked to that the, the, the workplace strategy is approved and progressed to support the future efficient operation of the organisation. I'm happy to propose that. Do I have a seconder? Second. Thanks, Mick. All those in favour? Great stuff. That's unanimous belief approved. So moving on, agenda item eight. Um, Cabinet Member Finance, Property and Assets, the Revenue and Capital Budget Monitoring Report, Quarter 1. Matthew Thompson. Uh, thank you, Leader. Uh, just first of all, to um, do this slightly, it's Quarter 1, so it's very, very early uh, in the financial year. But if I can just address uh, the bullet points in a slightly different order, uh, the Executive Summary, which is bullet points 4 and 5, um, is saying that we're forecasting a break-even uh, policy against the budget, um, which is always good news. And uh, bullet point five says that we are also forecasting that our general reserve, which we said would be 4.141, uh, a lot of ones and fours there, uh, 4.141 million at the end of the year, we're still forecasting that that will be the level of reserves um, at the end of the year. Recommendations to Cabinet are to note the forecast position for both revenue and reserves. Uh, and not the environments to the revenue budget that have been made as details in Appendix 2. Uh, this did go to the Scrutiny and Performance Panel on Monday. I wasn't able to make it, so thank you to the Leader and uh, Louise for uh, speaking to that committee. They've come back, oh, sorry, that panel, panel, not committee, it's a panel. Um, they've come back with some recommendations, which um, Cabinet, I'm sure, will be happy um, to accept. And the panel thanked the leader and the director of finance for attending, uh, welcomed the new uh, user-friendly layout, they're calling it, um, and the format of the report. They're grateful to the commitment for engagement and consultation, which we've already spoke to, uh, and that, that, that was particularly within regards to playground refurbishment programme. And they've asked for an update on the time scales involved in completing the Birch Avenue playground, which I'm sure will be happy um, to give them just to go through uh, some of the report, you, those members who follow this closely will see it is a slightly changed layout. Um, so there's a, there's a report to focus on revenue and reserves and then a separate one to look at the um, capital programme. Um, anybody who's done any accounting or run a business, um, you'll recognise these. For me, they look more like the profit and loss account and the balance sheet. Um, that you had when, um, certainly I did, uh, when I had a business. Um, so hopefully people will recognise the thoughts behind that. Um, tidied some other things up. So we, we, we're talking in millions of pounds and thousands of pounds rather than individual pounds now. Um, some of the numbers that we used to get were just so detailed before. Um, and I, I'm really pleased that the scrutiny panel uh, welcomed that work. Um, there's a lot of things we could, if people want to ask questions about, um, I'm happy to uh, do my best. Um, the lady did ask me and I'd forgotten. He asked me or, uh, and I've already forgotten. The, the main uh, difference um, is the contribution we've had to make to pensions. Um, members will recall, um, I think we've done it at least twice now, if I remember, it was Councillor Robinson who first signed us up to paying our pensions contributions up front uh, three years at a time um, be because, we, frankly, we were cash rich at the time and it gave us some consistency and we knew where we were and we've carried on doing that. Um, unfortunately, uh, the last time uh, the forecast was made, um, it, uh, it underestimated how much uh, we would have to put into uh, the pension pot. Um, so we're having to catch up. Basically, we're having to catch up. Um, you know, this is not, it's not an additional cost. It's not something, um, you know, that wasn't planned for. It's merely now us catching up on the pension uh, contributions that we have by law to make. Um, so that's the biggest 
the biggest item uh, that members may have uh, have spent have spent. Sorry about the Freudian slip that members may have noticed. Um, yeah, but other than that, I have nothing more to add at this stage. Thanks, uh, Matthew, and um, again from from cabinet. I know you know you and Louise. Thank you for the the new format of reporting. Yes, the the, the, the scrutiny. Um, Sorry, the budget performance and budget panel um, appreciated it. We appreciate it. I think it's much more user friendly for for all councillors to understand the exact position of both revenue and um, and the, the reserves and the program um, on the pensions. You're right. So it's basically, if I'm correct, Matthew. So the the pension additional pension contributions have been covered off on efficiencies that the council has managed to obtain in the first quarter. Anyway, so it's a cost neutral report anyway. So. Good news. Um, any questions from Cabinet to Matthew on the first quarter performance report? No. Any questions from any members not on Cabinet? Councillor Walton and then Councillor Alderby. Right. Thank you, Chair. Uh, my um, query is on page 78 of my report. Uh, item 11, background to the report. The council approved revenue budget included target savings of 190,000 comprising of 150,000 in staffing turnover and 40,000 from the expansion of shared services. Could you explain why the £40,000 um, seems quite a low figure? Uh, that was the budget. Um, that was the budget that all the council um, voted on. Um, if there's more to come, then the, the, we'll, we'll accept those um, efficiencies. But well, all that bullet point there tells you what we agreed when we um, agreed the budget in March. Yeah. So, so Karen, if you remember, that it doesn't that because this is an in-year budget report. So this is an additional forty thousand pounds of efficiency. This. Uh, municipal year and if you go remember we've still got the the compound effects of the original savings that we achieved the year before and the year before so i think we're up to about three hundred thousand pound four hundred thousand pounds per annum savings we're making that we generated through shared services over the last two years matthew is that correct approximately yeah but it's just in year councillor ogilvy thanks chair yeah it's just a quick um question on the um the understatement of the pension costs um, was that due to some kind of procedural issue that we've got something to learn uh, in terms of future or was it just due to external circumstances basically beyond the control of the council? So the um, actual calculation of the prepayment that we, we made was um, produced back in um, around November, December time 2019. And so what would normally happen the prepayment would be made and um, the, the um, Lancashire County Pension Fund would do a sort of truing up exercise at the end of the year because the actual pension contributions is never going to be exactly as the estimate. Um, but usually the um, figures are, are marginally different and so if there was a difference they would just let it roll until the end of the three year period and then address that again in the next triennial valuation um, and reflect it in a, an increase decrease um, in the in the um, costs going forward so in this instance because there's been movements in staff and um, the the actual figure was understated i think what 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 the lessons um, learned for us is that we just need to keep in liaison more with lancashire pensions to make sure that we are checking all the time that the actual level of pensions that what we are incurring is um, in line with the prepayment that's been made if indeed the decision was made by council to proceed on that basis going forward so there's definitely learning for us um, and um, and i will make sure that, that that is in place okay thank you for that i'm glad that if there is a lesson to be learned that we've learned it and we'll do something about it thanks for that okay thanks alan any other members Members of the public, Mr. Derbyshire. Uh, 
Uh, this is about the uh, capital program, Matthew. Uh, before I comment on the capital program and the balance sheet monitoring report, this might be difficult, I hope, man. May I thank Councillor Tomlinson's devotion to duty. I emailed him concerning the figures. He promptly replied, even though he's relaxing on his sunbed in the Canaries. First class, Matthew, I hope you took my advice and treated your wife to a first class C5 seafood paella. Pardons, wash it down with a couple of bottles of Ryoko. That's the hard bit. My, my question is, uh, you have planned to spend 18.988 million on what could be a possible new leisure facility in the 23-24 year. While at the same time, the climate change team will be proposing to spend large amounts of cash in the existing leisure facilities, upgrading lighting, etc., to save energy costs with projected long payback times, which will take priority. I don't think, I think um, Council again has already agreed the, the capital programme, um, but so strictly speaking, that's not about part of this report, but I'm, I'm more than happy to say, um, I think everybody, every, everybody in this council appreciates that our leisure centre stock is ageing. It's a conversation we've been having for Councillor Smith, eight years, maybe. Maybe, anyway, certainly we've been having it for a long time um, and we are, uh, we are going to have to invest in our uh, new leisure centres. At the same time, because those things are not yet determined and have been around for a, a while, we don't have a set date for any of that. We don't have a set date, um, although the, a, a medium term financial strategy is a medium term financial strategy. It's not set in stone. These things may happen and they may not. Um, but obviously, we, we would love to deliver a new uh, modern leisure facility um, at some stage in the near future. But in the meantime, we have to continue spending money on those ageing uh, leisure centres that we've got, which for me is just a further driver on why we must deliver a new leisure centre at some stage within the medium term uh, strategy. But in the meantime, we can't ignore the ones we've got. We just can't. Yeah, um, I fully agree that obviously the maintenance of the existing leisure centres needs to be taken into account safety and everything. But if the lights are working uh, and you decide to change them at ex really large cost, fluorescent tubes are very expensive to change and very hard to get rid of. Now, if you're going to get an expense that you can't get your money back on, it might be worthwhile thinking, well, do we have to change all those light fittings, all them bits and pieces, which aren't a safety aspect? But would be a good thing if leisure centres were keeping for a long period of time. Thank you. Obviously, um, Mr. Darbish, you're making an assumption there that all the existing facilities are going to be closed down, and nobody has ever said that that's going to happen. So, there you go. Ooh. Right. Well, go on, Councillor Smith. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I just missed my opportunity before, and it comes just on the back of the, the question that Councillor Ogilvy asked uh, with regard to this £500,000. If the calculation have gone the other way, would we have got £500,000 back? So I think the answer is no, isn't it? Because it would, have just, it would have just made a bigger profit on the pension fund. And it was 360, I think, Bill. Right, OK. So, um, Matthew, you've obviously placed the recommendations before us, as, as you said earlier. Um, you're proposing those. You, additionally, you, we, we, we welcome the comments from the scrutiny, um, scrutiny panel. Um, and we're willing to adopt those. Can I have a seconder for Matthew's? Thank you, Aniela. All those in favour? That's adopted, thank you. Right, something I've been really looking forward to, Councillor Tomlinson, land transfer at Vernon Carris, agenda item nine. Uh, thank you, uh, Leader. Um, this is a hugely um, exciting uh, project, potentially, um, and one that, as members will know, we've been discussing for uh, some months now. Um, Members will know of Councillor Titherington's commitment to a, uh, a more local leisure offer where more people can uh, take opportunities for leisure more locally. And this ought to be a really significant contribution 
to that ambition. Um, I'm not going to go into describing where the Vernon Carers land is because I'm, I'm certain that all members will know where that is. But as part of a significant building uh, pro, uh, programme there, this is the opportunity for us to take uh, ownership and control of a significant plot of leisure um, facilities, whether it's uh, cricket, football, the reservoir, um, and it could be really, I think, a regionally significant site, not just for the borough. I think this could be really, really important. Um, the uh, recommendations are on page uh, 112, uh, that we approve the transfer of the land and reservoir to South Ribble and the receipt of half a million pounds. That's a, a figure that our offices have been negotiating with. Um, the original offer was lower than that originally, um, and is, in, is the way with these negotiations. We, we went high, they went low, and I think we've come across uh, with a figure um, which everybody agrees will cover this council for a period of around 25 years for maintenance of that reservoir. Um, we're asked to approve the principle of the master plan. Again, with any master plan, these are principles, um, you know, so it's not details yet, but it does give um, a, a real good baseline for us to go forward from. And then we're asked to approve uh, the funding uh, of 150,000 plus of contingency for the refurbishment of the existing uh, sports club and changing rooms um, as uh, phase, part of phase 1A of the master plan. Uh, the money will be funded from section 106 monies um, along with um, the 25,000 from the new leisure local budget. Really, really exciting. Uh, as I say, I think this could be a significant site for us. Um, and in terms of delivering our aspirations around health and well-being, leisure and exercise, this is going to be a significant asset for the council. I know uh, Councillor Tithington's really uh, excited by it. And to be fair, uh, certainly in terms of uh, developing this uh, to this stage, I have to say that 99% of the credit is to him um, and his team. But as it becomes an asset for the council, um, it, it will be in my portfolio to get on and deliver something on here and then I will gratefully hand it back to Councillor Titherington to make sure that we um, can deliver some excellent, uh, exciting leisure facilities. Really, really exciting leader. Uh, thanks, Matthew. And just before I bring Mick in, I, I, I can't credit you all enough and Neil and Tony, the officers, for the, the work they've done here. We see up and down the country, don't we, 99% of the time, private sector developers building on every piece of green land they can possibly get the mitts on and losing community assets, losing pitches, losing, you know, lo losing bowling greens, every, everything you could possibly think of. And when you speak to the, when you speak to the team down at Vernon's, they, they, they are so excited at the opportunity now as a, a whole community they have to get behind this scheme. And the, the master plan looks great as well. And it's something that hopefully the, the entire council can get behind it. Um, mate, this is a, a huge opportunity and it's not just the gifting of the land, it's a substantial financial contribution as well, which, which you take huge credit for. And my next point is is to to both Matthew and Mick is now get on and when this is brought into council ownership, let's get on and deliver that master plan for the community. Mick? Uh, well, it certainly is uh, like all your Christmases have come up once, haven't you, really? I mean, it's probably, um, you know, uh, you know, it's been described as exciting. It's, uh, I mean, delighted. I mean, I find it uh, uh, difficult to find the, the adjectives to describe how pleased I am with the potential and the opportunity that there is here. I mean, it is a plot of land and already there is a cricket club on there. There is... Uh, a football club, there's bowling, uh, there's a box, there's a boxing club. Um, so the the opportunity uh, to uh, develop this is is really limitless, and uh, the, the 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 opportunity for the people, you know, in the immediate vicinity, and those people who will be occupying the houses that uh, that will be built there, but even beyond that, uh, throughout the borough. I mean, I think that this has the potential of becoming a centre of, of excellence uh, and uh, will uh, will be a, a crucial part uh, of our 
uh, leisure, leisure strategy. It, it, in the report, it does mention that we are also um, talking with the uh, land landowners uh, of uh, the adjoining football pitches for the potential of developing that into another uh, 3G pitch. Uh, and uh, members will have seen uh, the publicity that we had when the spade went in in Bamba Bridge, uh, when we had um, uh, the five times world champion uh, football freestyler and local uh, woman, um, Liv Cook there. Uh, so it's all sort of coming as part of, you know, the strategy is, 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 is coming alive. Um, I think the people, as you mentioned, leader um, down there, the committee members, uh, are all excited there, um, we're, we're engaging with them, uh, we're engaging with the uh, those that are organising the various uh, clubs there. Um, and uh, if you look at the, the, the master plan, it is all about uh, timing, um, but I mean, there is, there is a potential there. It's obviously, you know, a long way to go when we will be you know, we need, we need to develop it, but there are different stages there and uh, uh, it's just a, a question of sort of uh, getting on with it. I mean, and we are champing at the bits, but I mean, I really must uh, commend uh, the officers that have been involved in, the, uh, you know, in, with the negotiations with the various parties coming up uh, with the, uh, in, engaging in negotiations and also uh, discussing with uh, various, uh, you know, community bodies and sports clubs, um, and coming up uh, with, the, uh, with the with the master plan. Um, absolutely, you know, to put it in football terms, over the moon, fantastic. Really pleased to second it. Yeah. Thanks, Mick. And then the, you know, the the law of intended consequences here as well. And I know all the sports clubs down there are chomping at the bit because now it's going from private ownership into community ownership that they can all now apply for a multitude of grants for improvements that were never available to them historically and I know the FA, the ECB, um, the, the BMX, you know, the Sports England, oh, yeah. all of them, they're, yeah, they're all queuing up now to, to invest into this community asset and I, I can't commend you, Matthew and the officers enough for, for, for bringing this to us today. Um, any other points from members on cabinet? Any questions or points from Councillor Keith Martin? <clears throat> uh, thank you, Leader. Um, I, I, I too would like to reflect Councillor Tisington and, and your comments about how well this has come together now. Um, unfortunately, it's been gasping for air, uh, as, as, did the, um, as did the coach house, has been gasping for air for, for many, many years. Uh, and I'm glad we were first able to throw a a lifeline and then able to build the ship around it to keep them afloat. Um, I do look forward to the events going on there. It's a fantastic venue for some outdoor uh, entertainment as well as as, as sports. Um, I, I feel we must capitalise on our success of our younger people in, in the Olympics and recently in the tennis. I mean, they, I mean they're outstanding in, in what they've done. And of course, our uh, 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 disabilities representatives uh, on the Olympics as well and the, the re reflection of their success. Um, so we have an ideal opportunity here to, to really go forward and, and, and provide an excellent opportunity for people to take part and keep fit as well, which is vitally important. Thank you. Cheers, Keith. Yes, yeah, completely agree. I was, I was with their councillor, Will Adams, and we were, were talking and during the summer, there was literally on the Friday evening, I think Will said there was hundreds of kids down there, wasn't there, using the facilities and imagine What's going to happen now when we enhance the facilities and make them better? There'll be hundreds and hundreds more there, won't there? And it would have been a tragedy if anything had happened to Vernon's because it literally is a it's a local landmark, isn't it? You come in on the train on the, the West Coast Main Line and that's when you know you're, you're nearly home when you see Vernon's down there on the right. Um, any other questions from members? Any points? Councillor Karen Walton. Thank you, Chair. Yes, we welcome this first stage of the development and this council has worked hard, has been said, for many years to try to bring this development forward. And I know the area very well. My children all went to play down there and I walk past it quite on a regular basis. And I thank Gary and Neil for coming to speak to us today. Um, uh, about th this item and clarify some of our questions. There was just one question about the £20,000 a year maintenance. Um, will that be carried out in-house and will it be sufficient 
you think, for the maintenance mm. of the reservoir moving forward? It, we've done a lot of work on this um, to come up with that figure. Um, you know, um, people will, when we first discussed this, I think Councillor Clark raised a lot of questions about the cost and um, clearly his work experience meant he could ask uh, significantly better questions uh, than many members. So we are confident. We think it's a, a fair figure. Um, we think it's a good figure for the council um, and we're, we're confident that that will be enough. Um, it, it's, it's an asset that we will have to look after because there are risks uh, to owning a reservoir as, as well as potential uh, benefits uh, for leisure and all those kind of things. But we own now a significant, we will own a significant body of water right in the middle of the borough. So we will have to look after it properly. But we are confident. We are confident. We've done the work. Okay. Can I just come back oh, sorry, on, Karen, on just another point? Karen, sorry, yeah, yes, just sorry, add, Karen. I think there's an important point here. What we were able to do through the negotiation is get a lot of the bag, all, all the backlog maintenance yeah. done. Yeah. That, 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 that's so we've actually yeah. mitigated a great deal of the risk yes. uh, during that period. So yes, well and then, I, I, I understand, and this was part of our uh, of the the main central park area, you know, for the borough and everything. And of course, it, it does go on the back, as it says in the report, of nearly 500 houses going on that site as well. So I think the more that we can encourage green spaces and, and whatever in in that area, the better it will be. Just to, absolutely, Karen, but just to be clear, the Cabinet's not got any view on any housing going on there. That's for the Planning Committee, clearly, yeah, just that we're in public. Um, yeah, if you go down there, if you notice all the overflow, which is the critical area of the reservoir, the vast majority of it sounds brand new, so we're comfortable. But it's a, good, it's a good question, but we are, as Matthew says, we're comfortable that it's appropriate. So, uh, Councillor Ogilvy, then Councillor Phil Smith. Yeah, just very quickly on that, um, there's mention at paragraph 37 under risk about there will be an annual inspection and also a 10-year survey. I'm presuming that the 10-year survey will be done by this Dams and Reservoirs Limited, but the annual inspections, is that going to be an in-house inspection or is that some outside agency that we're going to have to pay for out of the 20,000 <coughs> annual figure? Yeah, it'll, ha it'll have to be accredited consultant that does the inspection for the the PI cover and the insurance, Alan, so it won't be us. Um, Councillor Phil Smith. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Chair. Obviously, I know this site very well um, and been dealing with it for, for many, many years. Um, and obviously, at some stage, it would have come forward prior to this, having developers not gone into liquidation and all the various other things. Um, and obviously, a key part of that is is bringing access to the land onto the causey. Um, that was a, the real final thing that needed put in place before this could actually come forward at all. Otherwise, uh, I think it would still be uh, languishing away. I think it was National Grid that owned the uh, the ransom strip, uh, and that uh, obstacle had finally been uh, finally been removed. Um, it is mentioned the, the link to uh, Central Parks, of course, it's in the Central Parks uh, master plan and obviously in the uh, our local plan as well, um, <clears throat> as, as is the housing that's on there, it's in, in, in the local plan, the housing that's due, to, well, due, due according to the master plan the, uh, to be delivered. Um, the, the green links and the biodiversity of the site is really, really important because that's really what it was designed to do in the first place, actually to deliver. And, um, and this, I believe that's yet to be discussed, but that's been the problem all the way along. They had a very short term lease and couldn't attract any finance. So uh, if that could be just outlined, that uh, would be, uh, be helpful. Thank you. Yeah, that will that will come forward, Phil. That That's not agreed yet, but they're in a completely different place negotiating with a public sector local authority than they are negotiating with a private sector developer. So as soon as that, that will come forward and if it's either either be published as an executive decision or it'll be coming forward to council or cabinet, I, I'm not sure where, but you will most certainly get to see it when it's agreed. And I must admit, we're really surprised that you've took credit for this, Phil, because you, you know, we know you've been negotiating most of these things, but never quite got there with any of them, but never mind. Um, can I come back then, Chair, please? Thank you. I'm not taking any credit for it. I'm taking credit for uh, bringing some of it forward. And um, like a lot of these things, um, uh, the amount of uh, hard work we've put in over a number of years and the things that are coming to fruition, um, 
is very very helpful to you I'm sure um, but um, the, the par parcel of land originally the cricket pitch and the, uh, the pavilion there was actually due at one stage to be given to uh, Vernon's um, with a previous developer if you like who, who went uh, into liquidation anyway well, suffice it to say we're happy it's coming forward yeah thank you thank you, yeah, thank you Phil um, any other questions from members? No, any questions from members of the public? No, good. Matt, I'm going to just ask you to just reconfirm the recommendations because there's some there's some big numbers in there and it's a and it's a big decision. Um, do you want me to read them out for you? No. You're right. Okay. The recommendations. Um, to Cabinet um, are at the top of page 112, uh, bullet point 6, that Cabinet approves the transfer of the land and reservoir to South Ribble Borough Council and the receipt of the sum of £500,000, that Cabinet approves the principles of the outline master plan. Further reports will come back through Cabinet and Council around the phasing of delivery and funding options for the component parts, and that Cabinet approves the funding of £150,000 plus a £25,000 contingency for the refurbishment of the existing sports club and changing rooms as Phase 1A of the proposed master plan. The £150,000 is to be funded from Section 106 and £25,000 from the new leisure local budget. Thank you, Matthew. Mick seconded it. Uh, all in favour? That's unanimous. Thank you, colleague. Well, just before we go into um, part two, into private session, um, just to remind all members of the press and public that the next meeting of the Cabinet is on the 13th of October, and it's actually going to be at the, the Methodist Church in Bamber Bridge as part of our Cabinet in the Community Initiative. Members will remember we wanted to commence this um, 18 months ago, but clearly because of the pandemic it was never possible. So. We look forward to seeing you all on the 13th of October, 6 o'clock, um, Cabinet, sorry, the Methodist Church in Bamber Bridge for the next meeting. So, given that, can I now, unfortunately, have to propose that we go into private session and they exclude the press and public. Can I have a seconder, please? Thanks, Mick. Um, can agree? Thank you. Right, okay.